morning. Uh, th this is a saint report, and today's saint is Saint Peter Christologus. And uh, as usual, before I begin, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the sections of my presentation. First, I'll tell you a little bit about the, the Roman Empire. This is uh, all of these saints in this series are doctors of the church. And right now we are in the fourth century of, uh, of Christendom, fourth century AD. And the Roman Empire figures very, uh, very significantly in the development of Christianity. So I'll give you a little bit about the Roman Empire. Then I'm going to tell you a little bit about St. Uh, Peter Chrysologus' biography. Then I'll tell you a little bit about um, what happened after the Pope had a great vision. There's a great vision that plays into this, this whole narration of his biography. And then I'm going to give you some examples of his writings. Basically what I find about St. Peter was that he's very much, those of you who know Father Bukorski would almost recognize St. Peter as the same type of person. In other words, uh, sort of a Midwestern, down-to-earth, um, very no-nonsense person who will, who's willing to say exactly what he thinks, and usually what he's thinking is something that will bring you closer to God. And just to give you an example of his no-nonsense approach before I get into the Roman Empire, I'm going to read to you one thing. This is, for example, he warned of uh, St. Peter was warning of the indecency of certain da dancing. And he cautioned, and he said, anyone who wishes to frolic with the devil cannot rejoice with Christ. That's just one little fast sentence, but it really tells you a lot about him and his approach to Catholicism and his approach to how he shepherded the people in his parish, which was very closely and without mincing any words. So that's the person we're talking about. And uh, now I'll give you a little bit about the empire. So the Roman Empire, just because now we've gone from the time of Christ all the way up to the end of the fourth century into the beginning of the fifth century with St. Peter, Chris, uh, Chris I want to give you kind of the, o the overall view of this. So the Roman Empire really got its uh, beginning very, very early in BC, and it was growing, but it became an empire in uh, 27 BC, and Augustus became the emperor. So then, by the time Christ was born, we we're now into the first century, what we call, now call the first century, and by about 1117, the Roman Empire had reached its height. It would never get bigger than that. After that, it's lost a few, few pieces of territory, such as mostly around Britain, the Britain area, around um, Eastern Europe, places like that, I should say, Eastern Germany. Um, but the Roman Empire did not exactly decline. It just sometimes lost pieces, sometimes gained pieces, but it was at its height in uh, 117 AD. Diocletian was the emperor towards the end of the third century. So around 200, 290, he issued laws uh, which affected Christianity dramatically. And off and on there were persecutions of Christians, but his was a very uh, specific effort to wipe out Christianity. And it was very virulent, and many people participated in the, um, in the murder of Christians during that time. And it was because of his edict that really tried to uh, wipe out Christianity. He was followed by Constantine, who in a way saved Christianity for mankind, because after Diocletian, what he was trying to do was wipe us out. Here comes Constantine, whose mother is a great saint. Uh, his name, her name was Helen, and she influenced him. So right from the beginning of his reign, which was in uh, 312 AD, he had a warm spot for Christianity. He eventually actually was baptized, but it wasn't until much later on in his adult, uh, adult life that he was baptized. 
but he had a soft spot and he began to help def uh, defend and develop Christianity. So that basically set the tone for what the Roman, Empire, Roman emperors did uh, after Diocletian. However, they weren't all uh, necessarily Orthodox Christians, and some were, many of them, in fact, were heretics, but all of them were Christians, maybe with one exception. I think um, Julian uh, was considered an apostate, so he was originally a Christian, and then he reverted to his pagan ways. Um, so now we get up to the, the, the time of P Peter Christologus. And the, the emperor at that time is Theodosius. Now you might remember Theodosius from when we talked about St. Ambrose quite a while ago and how dramatic the relationship was. Well, Theodosius was a, was a particularly important figure. Uh, next to Constantine, I would say maybe the second most important figure because in 380, so this is the same year that Peter Christologus was born, Theodosius, now an adult, and the emperor, he made Christianity the state religion. He issued an edict that Christianity was to be the state religion. And up until then, there were a lot of heresies, um, and of course paganism was still, I wouldn't say rife, it was on the wane, but it was still practiced, particularly by the um, aristocratic class, probably more for reasons of pride, but, you know, anyway, that's what they did. Theodosius then, about 15 years later, in 395, he actually banned paganism. So now this is during Peter's lifetime that Christianity becomes the state religion and paganism is definitive, definitively banned. So now in, the, um, in that period between Theodosius and the time the next emperor becomes, uh, takes, takes power, there is a, a period of time when it's not really clear who has the power, but mostly there's usurpers and there are, um, there's people who are taking power who don't necessarily follow the line of, um, I wanna say succession. So Theodosius' children did not necessarily take over after him. Um, Valentinian was the emperor when Peter, when Peter was an adult. And Valentinian reigned virtually the entire lifetime of our saint. I shouldn't say the entire lifetime, the entire uh, adult lifetime of our saint. Um, so he reigned from, um, let's see, 406 to roughly 450. So he was the, one of the longest reigning emperors. And this is important because Valentin never really took power. His mother reigned for a while as the regent, then his uncle, or a, a great patrician, and general basically was the power behind the throne or in front of the throne, if you will. So Valentina never really had power, although he was in, uh, in the, the seat of power called the emperor for 35 years. And um, because of this situation, it actually um, created conditions that led to the collapse of the Roman Empire in uh, 476. And that was 25 years after our saint died. So now I'm going to tell you a little bit about his life. So he was born in 380, and he was born into the region of northern Italy. So this makes him part of the Western, Western Christian Church. So many of the fathers, the doctors of the church, came from the Eastern, the Eastern Church that it's somewhat unusual to have a doctor from the Western Church. Nevertheless. Um, so he, we know very little about his life. And some people say that he was actually not born a Christian and was converted during his um, student years. Others say that he was born of a Christian family um, and just became more devout as time went on. We don't know, but what we do know is that Bishop Cornelius, who was the bishop in the town of Northern Italy where he was born, Imola, 
was his spiritual director and someone he was very close to, um, to, the, to the extent that the bishop, Cornelius, actually um, provided for his education and made sure that he had a very, very good education, probably because he saw in him um, an immense talent or potential talent that needed to be developed. And uh, that, was, uh, that was something he did for, for humanity with not necessarily uh, realizing it at the time. So the subjects that he would have studied would have been the typical subjects at that time. Rhetoric was the most important because that's basically how people communicated. Uh, there was very little written. Uh, people who were learned, who had studied, which were very few in number, they could read and write, but mostly everybody else communicated by word of mouth. And therefore, rhetoric and convincing people, being able to say what you want um, in you know, particularly beguiling ways, was very important for these educated people. So it was rhetoric, science, math. Um, for those who were Christians, it was scriptures and theology, um, philosophy, and um, you know, during, the, during the fourth century, there developed a new subject, which is called law. In the East, they actually taught this subject. They taught the subject of law, because the Roman Empire had its own laws. They taught the subject of law as a, as a discrete subject. In the, in the West, not so. In the West, those students who studied rhetoric very often would look to the law for subject matter so that when they debated each other during their uh, presentations of, of their rhetorical ability, uh, they could debate each other and have, have these debates based on knowledge. So in the West, while Peter did not study, study law directly, he was in an environment in northern Italy where first Milan was the capital. Remember when Theodosius was the emperor, Milan was the capital because that's where he lived. Later on, when Peter became the bishop of Ravenna, or Ravinia, that became the capital because that's where Valentinian and his mother, the regent, lived. So that's how the capital was, was determined by where the emperor lived. So in, in that part of Italy, they studied law as the background, as a background subject. But he was fascinated by it. And the reason this is important is because his homilies, of which we have something like 187 of his homilies, have come down to us intact. And they are beautiful and they are very, very important. Why are they so important is because he, like Father Pekorsky, spoke to his parishioners. His objective was your soul. Every word that he said was, had, a, had an objective of elevating your spiritual life and infusing you with the orthodox um, doctrine so that you would not be dissuaded from uh, the orthodox faith by all of the heresies that were abounding. And there were many of them. You remember that previously I've mentioned Arianism. There was monophysism. Um, there, was, uh, there were so many, I'm not going to go into it now, but you know that there were quite a number. So he, he had that objective, and this ability with rhetoric was very important for him, plus the way he used the law. His parishioners were a full range of people. Many of them, the bulk of the population, were very, very poor. And they were, they were particularly crushed by the laws that were pertaining to borrowing, um, lending, uh, the way courts were, the, the way court de decisions came down, many times there was corruption, and so even if a person uh, was in the right with respect to um, a lending situation, the poor generally came out the worst. So he was very, very aware of this, and there's a whole body of his lectures that relate Roman law to the scriptures. And he, what he does was he takes the scriptures and he blends them together with the law, making the scriptures very, very palpable, very real to people, 
by the analogy with the laws that, that they were living under at that point in time. And I would love to read you some of it, but um, time, uh, I've, I've fixed some readings I'm going to do, but the, the ones about the law are not some of those that I've chosen this time. Anyway, um, he, after he completed his education, he was a deacon. Um, Bishop, uh, what was his name? Cornelius ordained him a deacon and really encouraged him to become a monastic type of person. I don't know that he lived in a monastery, but he lived a very ascetic monastic type of life for many years. And we don't know very much about that period of time. But one day, the, the Bishop of Ravinia, which was where the, the, the um, uh, emperor was living at that time, that bishop died, Bishop John. And his replacement, as was the custom at that time, was voted on by the clergy and the people of that town. Those, those people then contacted Bishop Cornelius of Imola and asked him if he would please travel to Rome to the Pope to get the Pope to agree that this new bishop would be the one that's selected. When Bishop Cornelius decided to make this trip, he took Peter with him. Now, this is where the vision comes in, because before they met, so they, are, they arrive in Rome, before they had their meeting with the Pope, the Pope has a vision of Saint Apollinaris, who, was, who had been the first bishop of Ravinia, and Saint Peter the Apostle. And they are both saying to him, look, here is Peter, so they have this, he has this vision of these two great saints with Peter Christologus. And they are pointing to him and saying, this is the man who should be the Bishop of Ravinia, not the one that the people have chosen. So Pope Sixtus then makes the decision to go ahead with what he was recommended in his vision. So the deacon, who had never even become a priest, was now elevated to be Bishop of Ravinia. And from that point on, he was one of the most remarkable people in the history of the Catholic Church because he went from the monastic life, where probably he did very little pre preaching, to a life where he was very visible and very responsible for a huge area of Northern Italy and all the souls many of whom now were converted to Christianity because of the edicts of Theodosius, um, making Christianity the, the state religion and banning paganism. So um, I wanted to tell you a little, about, a little bit about some of these uh, homilies that he gave. He was noted for the short homily. And this, this was what he, this was one of the things that made him very modern, because he understood the importance of uh, images in his presentation. So he would paint a picture of images of something and have those in your mind while he was preaching some aspect of scriptures. Very much like what Father Ruiz did today with preaching to us and what Paul did preaching to us also about the Eucharist painting images so that they're in your mind at the same time you're appreciating the words about the scriptures. So he was very well known for his, his beautiful oratory. Because if his, he was so well known for his oratory that the very first time that he preached as bishop, the empress and the emperor attended with all of their courtiers and listened to his wonderful words, after which he got the, he, he originally was just Peter, and after that, the Empress, Galida Placidia, gave him the moniker, if you will, of Christologus, which means golden words or golden speech, and that stuck to him, and that's why we have come to know him as Peter Christologus, because the name <clears throat> was given to him by the Empress and the Emperor. Um, 
among the subjects that he spoke about, um, he was he was absolutely um, orthodox in everything he said, but he was he never evinced great ability to be a theologian. Nevertheless, here's the subjects that he preached uh, more than once, sometimes in series of, of um, preachings. He believed in the, the perpetual virginity of Mary, the mother of God. He um, believed and preached many times about the primacy of Peter. These were subjects that were in discussion in the environment there. They may, they may not necessarily have been heresies, but probably they were addressing heresies because that's one of the things he was trying to do, was stamp out heresies and stamp out the vestiges of paganism. And so his, his homilies address these things, sometimes indirectly, but sometimes very directly. So the primacy of Peter was a very, very big deal in those days because the Eastern Church um, always held back a little bit from being a real advocate of the primacy of the, the Pope in Rome. They always were a little bit reticent. And that eventually, as you know, led to the, the, the bifurcation of the church in the, um, what, the 11th century, which we're still living with today. Um, the heresies that he had to combat, uh, Arianism, which you've pre previously heard me talk about, um, they, that denied the divinity of Christ. Um, the one that was most rife in his days was about, uh, was monophagism. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right, Mon monophagism. Um, and they, that heresy actually believed that Christ had one nature and it was, um, oh, it was a fused nature, that God had, that Christ had the nature of God and the nature of man, but it was fused, whereas the Orthodox belief is that he had the nature of man and the nature of God as separate natures in, in one divine Jesus Christ. The other uh, heresy that came up was related to that, and that was um, pushed by Eutyches, and he was an Archimandrite, which means he was the head of a series of monasteries around Constantinople. A very revered guy. He was very much um, looked up to and had great influence on the people. And his, his belief was that monophagism didn't take the heresy far enough. And he believed that Christ had only one nature, which was divine. So you have the monophysitism who said it was a fused nature, but he said, no, it was just a divine nature. And one of the things that, that happened that was very um, important in those days was that uh, the, the emperor was always trying to fight these heresies because he wanted to bring the empire together. There were so many things going wrong in the empire at that time that trying to keep Christianity together was one way of uh, at least bringing peace domestically so that the borders could be defended, uh, which they poorly were at that time. And the, um, let's see, so, the, uh, let me say one word about the effects of the law. Because uh, Peter was very interested in the law and many of his, the best oratory uh, to his parishioners concerned uh, legal matters as they pertain to their their lives. The um, it was possible. I thought that it was very possible that these preachings had an influence on the emperor and his his mother because they were many many times in attendance at his church. And I looked into that, and it's sad to say that although Valentinian the third did undertake some legal reforms. Uh, they were not of the type that really could have influenced the condition of the impoverished people at that time. I think he had, uh, his heart was in the right place, but he didn't have the right system in place for it to take place. So although Peter did his best, it didn't uh, really have much effect. 
Um, one of the last things I'm going to tell you about is, um, in addition to his preachings, he also wrote a very important letter to Utichis. Utichis had been banished during um, uh, one of the one of the bump councils that took place, and um, in uh, in response to that, he wrote to the Pope, Pope Sixtus, and he wrote to Peter asking the support of both of them and defending his position. And Peter, in response, wrote back and basically said, look, you're very, very wrong here. And other heretics, <laughs> he said, okay, you're a heretic. Other heretics have come to no good. Look at history and look at what happened at the other heretics. Look at what happened with Arian. Look at what happened with other heretics. And you see that they end up in very bad circumstances and usually die outside the church. So put all of that aside, come back to the Orthodox faith. Well, Utichis didn't do that, but this letter that he wrote to Utichis also found its way into the Acts of um, Chalcedon. Now that was one of the great councils that took place in 451. And it was called in order to resolve some of the issues of the heresies. And as part of the Acts, they included this letter that Peter Chrysologus wrote to Utichis, because it is the one document where you really see that he deeply understood theology. He was not a theological preacher, but that doesn't mean that he did not understand theology and could have done it like some of the other great doctors of the church, but he was more intent on saving the souls of the poor who were predominantly in his parish and subject, subject to the uh, whips and saws of the heresies of the days. So, um, so that is part of his claim to fame, is that he, he has his letter to Utichis in the Acts. Well, the Acts are like the uh, proceedings, the proceedings of a, of a council today. They were called Acts, and all of the all of the councils have acts that you can actually find online if you're interested in that. Um, he died in 450, so he died just before the council. Um, but we know that if it had, a, if, had a, if he could have, he probably would not have attended because Chalcedon was held in uh, in uh, Turkey, modern day Turkey. Today, that uh, Chalcedon is called Katakoy. And if you ever go to Istanbul, you can take a ferry, and on the ferry, as the ferry is going along the, the, the Bosphorus to drop off uh, people, you know, who are going to and from work, they'll call Katakoy. And when you look onto the land, you will see the very place where that uh, Chalcedon Council took place. So, um, let's see, how much time do I have left? Oh, I still have a few minutes, okay. Um, there's one thing I wanted to read to you, which, because we're Dominicans, I felt like this, this is very important to, um, to understand that he was one of the early Dominicans without knowing it. Um, here's what he wrote about learning, and that's what we're doing, right? We learn and we preach, and this was what he did to a fairly well. This is what he preached to his congregation. Learning is recommended by reason, authority, and the example of saints. And next to virtue is doubtless the greatest improvement of the human mind, an instrument of piety and religion. By it, the noble man is qualified for the superior rank he holds among men and is capable of directing himself and others is drawn off from sari, debauchery, and idleness, possesses the art of filling, most usefully and agreeable, all his vacant hours, and acquires a relish for the pleasure of true rational knowledge, then which man can enjoy no greater or more noble except those which piety and virtue infuse. By exercise and application, the memory and other powers of the soul are perfected. The understanding is furnished 
with true ideas and a just way of thinking, and the judgment acquires true justice and taste. In a pastor of souls and the minister of religion, how essential the qualification of a consummate skill in sacred learning is. It is needless to show the infinite obligations of that charge, making it manifest to all men. How grievous then is the crime of those who are engaged in this state, yet idly throw away the time they owe to study of sacred scriptures, to holy meditation, and the application to the science of morality and the pulpit. So I'm going to conclude there. And uh, if you wanted to find any of these prayers online, I would suggest that um, it's a little bit difficult, but it's doable. And the, the best way to do it is by looking for the PDFs. If you put in the search term with his name and some of his preachings, ask for the PDFs and you'll usually get the, um, the actual words that he spoke. Thank you.